Well, kids, other star franchises may be more well-known for super weapons, but that doesn't mean that Star Trek doesn't have a fair few dangerous things on its own. Well, here's a collection of super weapons from the Star Trek universe in our latest Star Trek ship breakdown. Welcome to Trek Central, lords, ladies, and sovereigns. I am your host, Lieutenant Commander Adam, and we are not going to get straight into it because the red alert klaxon just went off. Seriously, listen. Why did it go off? Well, because we just noticed that only 16% of you are subscribed. What? What are you waiting for? Become the ultimate Star Trek fan and hit that subscribe button. Like now. If you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, and follow us as well on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. And as always, please let us know your thoughts in the comment section below, because if you're talking about Star Trek, then we want to hear about it. All right, now we can engage. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends, so a big thank you to them. Raid Shadow Legends has taken over, and gaming will never be the same again. With over 600 champions blessed with unique skills, you can build your team, develop your champions, and raid your way. All this in the world of Teleria. You can explore millions of champion combinations and master countless tactics as you take on raid bosses, dungeon runs, campaign battles, and PvP arena matches. My favorite faction is the High Elves, because of course they are. The backstory of this faction is awesome. Their homeland, Aravia, has been around for thousands of years, surviving the fall of the Lizardmen Empire, helped the humans form into civilizations, and defeated the Orcs when they formed a huge horde and attacked the continent. But then, things got twisted when Siroth, the Lord of Darkness, convinced a bunch of elves to go evil and attack the kingdom. The civil war nearly ended the elves, but Aravia survived, rebuilt, and now it's stronger than ever. This month is huge for Raid. A brand new faction has just been released, the Sylvan Watchers. New champions are joining Raid Shadow Legends, including Forest Elves, Ents, Druids, and Fae. I'm super excited to get in and have a play with them. And if that's not enough, Raid's got a full lineup of events, along with a new season of the Forge Pass, where you can get your hands on some of the most powerful gear the game has ever seen. Also, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can get your exclusive rewards in Raid right now. So, if you haven't started playing Raid yet, click the link in the description or scan our QR code here on the screen and you'll get unique bonuses worth $30. We're talking a free champion, Rector Drath, 200k silver, one energy refill and one XP boost. Oh, and of course, one ancient shard, meaning you can summon awesome champions as soon as you get in game. So what are you waiting for? All of this treasure will be waiting for you in game. Download Raid Shadow Legends today. So we're going to start with a time ship, and not just because it's one of the oldest <laughs> super weapons we're going to look at. The Krenum time ship was first constructed in the 22nd century by Anorax of the Krenum Imperium, a Delta Quadrant-based superpower which possessed highly advanced temporal technology. This ship was approximately 1600 meters in length, and it was constructed to destroy a rival state of the Krenum Imperium, the Rilnar which had caused the Imperium to decline in power during the 22nd century. Therefore, the weapon was made exclusively to remove the Rilnar people and civilization from the timeline, eliminating them from existence. However, this caused a plague to spread throughout the Krenum Imperium, which was, hilariously, previously kept at bay by Rilnar antibodies that had been introduced to the Krenum gene pool. The Krenum timeship proved its own civilization's undoing, and for the next 200 years, with the ship isolated from the space-time continuum so no one on board ever aged, Anorax, the military temporal scientist who oversaw construction of the time ship and commanded it, would make numerous temporal incursions to not only restore the Krenum Imperium, but also his wife and children who had been killed by the plague. In trying to better his civilization's past, he undid its future. The Krenum time ship was not only equipped with this main temporal weapon, which could target planets or ships and remove them from the timeline altogether. But if the ship re-entered normal space-time, it could use directed energy weapons to defend itself from attack. As the Krenum time ship kept erasing civilizations from the timeline, the ship inevitably ended up as a museum of lost treasures, relics from civilizations who never even existed. In one timeline, the ship even met the USS Voyager, and for the next part of a year, Anorax and a strong Krenum Imperium, with other temporal texts such as Chronoton Torpedoes, hounded Voyager. 
But after developing temporal shielding and forming an alliance with the Mawazi and the Nahydran, the group attacked the Krenim timeship, and with a little help from a mutiny on the inside, they were able to destroy the temporal core powering the ship and make it so that the weapon was never built in the first place. Anorax would never finish his designs for the timeship in this altered timeline, and the Krenim Imperium would become a modest power in the Delta Quadrant without their temporal technology to embolden or destroy themselves. Now, the Krenim weapon ship itself was designed by concept artist Steve Berg, and with Voyager moving to CGI, it was one of the CGI artists who got to come up with the designs for the ship of the week, as it were. His first sketch of the Krenim ship was extremely close to the end result, describing it as looking literally like a giant gun, which, you know, fair enough. The next superweapon, also from Star Trek Voyager, is a literal planet killer that belongs to a species that came from a type of space very different to our own, and that is fluidic space, with the species 8472 and their planet killers. 8472 belonged to an extra-dimensional realm which was filled with a form of organic fluid and contained no stars or other celestial bodies normal to our space. The Borg had managed to find a way into fluidic space using interdimensional rifts and had tried to assimilate species A472 due to their biological and technological distinctiveness, which honestly at this stage is just starting to sound like an excuse. Kick your ball over the fence, we will assimilate you because biological and technological distinctiveness. The Borg invaded your planet. Biological and technological distinctiveness. The Borg stole your favorite cup. Biological and technological distinctiveness. The point is they use it a lot. Species 8472, <coughs> getting back on topic, roamed in bioships, organic ships which were immune to many forms of damage and even assimilation, with themselves being immune to assimilation as well, which was handy. With this act of aggression by the Borg, they decided to retaliate and attacked normal space, coming with their ships which were already able to destroy Borg cubes by themselves, which could be considered a superweapon unto their own. However, the superweapon we're talking about is when eight of these bioships directed their already incredible firepower into one energy-focusing ship, which had the power to destroy entire worlds in seconds. These ships were only 50 meters in length and had a single crew member to operate them. So for a superweapon, nine crew? Not bad at all. Individually, they were also formidable, as stated, having biogenic energy beams that could destroy Borg cubes and were powered by electrodynamic fluid. These ships, however, were vulnerable to biomolecular warheads created by the Doctor of the USS Voyager, which was nothing more than a specially modified photon torpedo, which contained modified nanoprobes that could break down bioships in quick time. Just like the Krenim ship, the Species 8472 bioships were also designed by Steve Berg. The ship in the script was described as small, organic-looking biomass, bulbous and ashen, strange, and like the body of a squid attached to the hull. No tentacles. Getting very specific at the end there, especially. Steve Berg looked at sea creatures to inspire his design and make it look like it was capable of latching onto a Borg ship and look good whilst flying through space as well. Well done indeed. Now we move on to my personal favorite super weapon, I suppose. The Scimitar. It was the Riemann Warbird, constructed by the Riemann forces of Shinzon, and became his flagship when he successfully led a coup against the Romulan Senate to become Praetor, after the entire Senate developed a particularly lethal cold all at the same time. Fancy that! The Warbird was built in secret on the planet Remus and was meant to be utilized as a superweapon to destroy the Federation, using its Thaleron radiation weapon to kill all life on a planet in a matter of seconds, with its first target being Earth. The Scimitar was 890 meters in length and kept the usual Bird of Prey style for Romulan ships, even if it was a Riemann ship. Its wings could unlock and open in order to fire its Thaleron weapon which was powered by a generator aboard the starship, on the bridge, which became very volatile when activated. It wasn't stopping with just the Thaleron weapon in the overpowered department, however, because it also came with a ridiculously good cloak, which made it virtually invisible 
with no residual energy signatures at all. It can even fire weapons, activate shields, and go to high warp speeds while the cloak was active. Something which hadn't been seen since the Klingons tried it at one time. God, I miss Christopher Plummer. Alongside this cloak, the Scimitar had 52 disruptor banks, 27 torpedo bays, and even a complement of Scorpion-class attack fighters, which made it a formidable target, but still not as overgunned as the Defiant. <coughs> and even defensively, it had primary and secondary shields, and could fight numerous ships at the same time, and still have the advantage. The Scimitar had one fatal flaw, however. <laughs> it wasn't immune to being rammed in the face by a Sovereign-class ship. No! Imagine that. All of those guns and it couldn't even tank one decent headbutt. Pathetic. I'm being ridiculous because it is a hard vulnerability to cover up, but during the battle in the Basin Rift, the ship was left disabled due to such a ramming maneuver and its Thaleron generator was destroyed, which caused a chain reaction, which then blew up the whole damn thing. The description of the scimitar in the script was, Our first sight of this incredible ship is absolutely breathtaking. Shinzon's vessel combines the clean lines of the traditional Romulan warbird with unique weapons and styling. It is huge, easily twice as large as the Enterprise, and it is aggressive, awesome in its power. The ship was designed by Trek veteran John Eaves. Of course it was, who started with a classic battleship design, but took on design elements of insects with its extending sections of its wings. Staying on the Romulan side of super weapons, after the scimitar we had the Narada, a simple Romulan mining ship <laughs> that was augmented with Borg technology to become the super weapon we know. As stated, the Narada started life as a simple mining vessel belonging to Nero of the Romulan Empire, a miner, in case the mining vessel thing wasn't a dead giveaway. However, after the Federation had abandoned their Romulan relocation mission due to the attack on Mars in the year 2385, this ship was upgraded at a secret Romulan facility known as the Vault. This facility housed Borg technology, possibly recovered from the Artifact, an abandoned Borg cube in Romulan space. With upgraded Borg technology, the Narada looked nothing like it previously did, growing to a massive 9,368.7 meters in length. It still retains some aspects of its former life as a mining vessel, namely its retractable mining drill, which was able to drill into a planet's core, but with the new Borg technology came new weaponry such as shrapnel torpedoes, which were capable of absolutely shredding ships. With the use of the retractable drill and red matter, procured from the jellyfish which Spock had attempted to use to save Romulus and destroy the Romulan supernova, the Narada was capable of destroying entire worlds, a common theme in this list. By drilling into the planet's core and using the red matter to artificially generate a black hole to absorb said planet. The Narada was designed by James Klein, with the design for the ship being asymmetrical in order to contrast with the symmetry of the Enterprise. Thinking of what the scariest thing in space might be, for some bizarre reason, production designer Scott Chambliss picked up a kitchen knife and imagined 500 gigantic knife-edge points. And thus, the Narada was born. A kitchen nightmare if I ever heard one. In the 32nd century, after the burn issue had been dealt with, Starfleet faced another crisis with the DMA, the Dark Matter Anomaly, which roamed the galaxy destroying anything which was unfortunate enough to be in its path, from the Quajani homeworld to inhabited asteroid chains and deep space outposts. However, the DMA was not actually a super weapon per se, but we'll still count it due to its destructive capabilities. It was actually a mining tool utilized by a species Starfleet designated Species 10C. 10C was an extragalactic superpower, but it almost faced extinction due to a cataclysmic event which destroyed their home system. To defend themselves against any future threat, Species 10C created a hyperfield, a massive force field which surrounded their new home system and were protected from danger. However, the power cost required to power this hyperfield was enormous! 
and only the power generated from omega molecules could sustain it, which required boronite to synthesize. The DMA was their solution to getting a ready supply of boronite, a massive gravitational anomaly five light years across, which went to locations of high concentrations of boronite and mined them. After the USS Discovery made first contact with Species 10C, with representatives of the Federation and of affected planets like Quajan were able to empathize with the 10C, who would agree to aid in cleaning up any damage their DMA had caused and no longer mine for boronite to sustain their hyperfield, as they too were continuing this same cycle of destruction that led their homeworld to be destroyed out of fear. Zindi weapons were mobile planet killers which originally could cause massive planetary damage, but once refined were capable of blowing up entire worlds. They were created by the Zindi as a first strike weapon against Starfleet, as they had been warned by an extra-dimensional species, the Sphere Builders, that Earth would destroy the Zindi in the far future. This was, of course, a lie as it was actually the Sphere Builders who wanted to make sure Earth would never create the Federation, which would prove to hinder their plans of galactic colonization in the 26th century. The Zindi weapon was designed by Degra, a Zindi primate scientist and constructed by the Zindi Aquatics. Most of its components, like chemocyte, were refined by Zindi Arboreals, but at least some of its components were from the future, supplied by the benevolent Sphere Builders. The first Zindi weapon prototype was a small one-man probe, which was able to fire a particle beam which destroyed a massive straight area from Florida to Venezuela, killing 7 million people in 2153. The Enterprise was sent into the Delphic Expanse to find the source of this weapon, and would, along the way, along with the help of Greylek Dur at Zindi Arboreal, sabotage the construction of the second prototype of the Zindi weapon which was only able to blow up part of a small moon. The final prototype of the Zindi weapon was launched by a rogue faction in the Zindi Council of Zindi Reptilian and Zindi Insectoids, with the former betraying the latter. This final prototype made its way to Earth, though it was attacked by a joint force of Starfleet, the Andorian Imperial Guard, the Zindi Aquatics, Arboreals, and Primates. The final prototype was boarded, and its reactor was set to overload, blowing it up. It was decided that the Zindi weapon would have a kinetic structure to it, which would constantly move to make it menacing. Some of the inspiration for this design was Chinese ivory puzzle balls, which consist of a number of highly detailed carved hollow spheres and are made from a single solid block to look impossible. The design would be made by the one and only John Eaves, who would also design a lot of the Zindi ships in Season 3 of Enterprise as well. And last but not least, in a rundown of super weapons from the Star Trek universe, we would of course be remiss if we did not mention the OG, the Doomsday Machine, from the original series episode of the same name. The Doomsday Machine, or the Planet Killer as it was also called, was first encountered by the Federation in 2267. And I would like to point out, for the benefit of those who are planning on hanging me from the gallows for making jokes at its expense, that I actually really, really loved the Doomsday Machine episode. Seriously, it was some of the best acting that featured on TOS, in my humble opinion. So back off and leave me alone. This extragalactic weapons hull was composed of neutronium, making it heavily resistant to most forms of weaponry, with its only weakness being its mouth at the front of the ship. But we call it its mouth because it is the most apt description, as the planet killer would destroy planets, by firing an anti-proton beam out of it to destroy those planets and then consume their rubble for energy. The vessel was first found by the USS Constellation, under Commodore Decker, who went to investigate why all planets in system L370 had been destroyed. In the nearby system of L374, the planet killer was found destroying one of the planets. The Constellation was attacked by the planet killer and sustained heavy damage, and was even unable to call for help, as the machine emitted a dampening field which made communication impossible and left the damaged ship nearly powerless. The Enterprise would find the Constellation and recover its captain, who would go mad with survivor guilt, steal a shuttle from the Enterprise, and pilot it into the maw of the machine, which did cause its power to drop, 
This allowed Kirk to come up with the plan of piloting the constellation itself with its minimal energy into the maw of the planet killer, which would kill the machine, but leave its body floating lifelessly through space. Norman Spinrad, who wrote the episode The Doomsday Machine, was actually disappointed with the model for the ship, imagining it had numerous evil-looking weapons along its hull to look even more menacing and be even more dangerous. A later book actually said this would have been its original form with its complete arsenal of weaponry, but after centuries of combat and time passing, the ship would be stripped to its main weapon only. However, I can't help wondering if there are any more of those weapons wandering around the universe. Well, I certainly hope not. I found one quite sufficient. But that about wraps it up. Seven super weapons of the Star Trek universe. Not quite a tongue twister, but hey, it was close. Did we miss any? If we did, let us know, and we may even do a video on it. But if you have any other ships in the meantime you'd like to see us take a look at, then say so in the comments below, because as always, if you're talking Star Trek, we want to know about it. If you want to keep up to date with all the latest Star Trek news, lore, and more, and keep the Red Alert klaxons from giving me a migraine, then please do subscribe and never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media, join the community Discord server, all of that good nonsense. But for now, I've been Lieutenant Commander Adam. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends.